I'm David Sensor. I'm interviewing Dr. Mark Rosenberg. We're on the stage at CDC, April the 3rd, 2008. Dr. Rosenberg has been informed that he's being filmed and, and audioed and assigned a release for us. So we'll start and, and tell me a little bit about your early days. Well, I grew up in a family that was committed to social service and community action, health, medicine, public welfare. And uh, I had a father who was very interested and active in his unions. He was in a good union, the International Typographical Union, and didn't go to college until he put all his kids through college. And my mother was a physician and she practiced for 61 years in Montclair, New Jersey, the town where we grew up. And she did some very good things, socially active things in New Jersey. She was the first physician ever to see black um, people as patients in her office. She volunteered for Planned Parenthood and she was the physician at Montclair State College for about 35 years and maintained a private practice for a long time. And I think she was a very important influence. I'd like to think that I made a rational choice to go into medicine for reasons X, Y, and Z, but I think probably trailing her around for a long time, seeing what she did, and having that kind of spill over, being exposed to how much she valued what she did, probably influenced me to go into medicine. I went into medicine, I guess, after college. I went to medical school and was always still interested in public service. And during medical school, took time off to go study government and public policy at the Kennedy School for the first year that it ever had a combined MD, MPP program. So went there, spent a couple of years there, and then did an internship and a residency. And then I had signed up for a draft deferment, but the draft had ended before I went and came to CDC because it was something I wanted to do. It seemed like an interesting way to learn about public health and came here and was in the enteric diseases branch for two years with a very, very good crew of people. And it was an exciting branch. We had lots of outbreaks. We had salmonella, shigella, botulism, waterborne diseases. and. Um, the opportunity came up to go work on smallpox in India, and it seemed like a fascinating chance to do something very different from enteric diseases in the United States. So I signed up to go off to India. I did not have any idea of what to expect. What was your first impression of India? I thought I had stepped into the set of a movie a movie that started 2,000 years ago and was an unbelievable mix of people. I went to West Bengal and we were around Calcutta and spent a lot of time in Calcutta and I just thought it was a fascinating city, an incredible place, the mix of people, um, people driving in cars and people living on the streets. And the other thing, I've always been interested in photography, and I decided I wanted to do a lot of photography in India. And I just remember the scenes of incredibly beautiful brown bodies throughout the state. I mean, people in the fields working in the sun and starting to sweat, people getting up in the morning on the streets as the sun started to go up, living on the streets, but living very clean lives, bathing, living, feeding, raising families while living on the streets. Visually, it was an incredible place to be. Was all of your time in India spent in West Bengal? Just about. The time working was in West Bengal, but then at the end I took an extra month and went with Jill, who was to become my wife, and we traveled around more of the standard tourist places. We went to Delhi, we went to the Taj Mahal, we went to the Ganges, we went to Assam. We went to Darjeeling, Nepal, Kathmandu. We traveled a fair amount. Was there much smallpox in uh, 
Calcutta when you were there? Unfortunately, there was none that I could find. When we got there in 1976, we were searching for cases, and that was basically the work that I did um, during the day and evenings. We went around a team with myself, a driver, and an interpreter looking for cases of smallpox. And we put out rewards, but the cases that were reported to us were really um, chicken pox at that time. And the rewards started going up and up and up. And um, we didn't find a single case of smallpox. It made me feel like we were kind of in a, a second wave. And I wished I had been there when there was smallpox because we were kind of the cleanup crew. Were you there uh, on your own or were there other people from CDC and WHO? There were other people from CDC who went over with me at about the same time. Um, Dick Jackson, I remember, went at the same time. Then we ended up back at CDC. We both left for a while after our EIS time and then came back to CDC and served there at the same time. So there are several people from was CDC. Was he in, in West Bengal? or? In, um, he, I don't think Dick was in West Bengal. No. But you were there alone? Um, no, there was someone from Czechoslovakia, uh, Fred Begar. Um, and he was there. He was an older person who had served as a community or state epidemiologist in Czechoslovakia and then had come back uh, to do this service. So we were there together and saw each other when we came back to the city. We spent most of our time in the suburbs, isn't the right term, but outside of Calcutta in the very small villages, um, driving around routinely, but also then taking detours where if there was a report of a case, we'd go check it out. Who handled your administrative details? Um, there was someone assigned from WHO, and I don't remember um, the name of the person, but someone in Calcutta itself. Uh, Bill Fagy had left India by then? I think he did. I think he was ordered back by someone. Or no, he wasn't ordered back. He came back against orders. That's right. That was the amazing story. No, Bill had left. Um, so I didn't really encounter Bill in um, India at the time that we were there. The person who was in charge was a French person who was assigned by WHO. Nicole. I think so. Grasse. Uh-huh. And... Um, no, Bill had been there, and I didn't really get to know Bill until we came back, and then he was, Bill was a preventive medicine residency um, head back here. So what I worked with Bill on was back here at the case of Crater Lake. We worked that up into a teaching case for preventive medicine residents, but unfortunately he wasn't in India when I was there. I'm sure you have this story about Bill's departure from there, but it's one that impresses me. One of the things that we work on now is the issue of collaboration and coalitions. And we've looked at lots of coalitions in global health, looking for the elements that make them work. When are they successful? When are they not? What do you need to think about when first putting them together? How do you frame that last mile? What do you set as your goal? Because the most, ex the most important element in any successful coalition is framing that last mile in a way that everyone develops this shared goal. And that is an overriding goal and a motivating goal to keep you together. So we've studied a lot of coalitions in global health because it turns out, even though there are many coalitions formed, very few of them succeed. So one of the stories that we talk about is what's necessary for a good leader to be an effective leader of a coalition. And one of the things that you need is really this quality of ego submersion. You need to be willing to step back and let your partners stand in the spotlight and get the attention, get the publicity, let them get the credit. And I think there's never been anyone as good as Bill in doing that. And the story that always impresses me when I think of this notion of ego submersion is Bill um, 
going to India when he was sent there by you to work and to apply the containment theory. And as I heard it, Bill decided that several months before the last case was eradicated in India, he would come back home. And he could come back home because the containment theory, even though it was questioned at times and almost reversed by the Minister of Health, they were able to continue it long enough to see it succeed. And within a very short period of time, less than two years, the cases started to fall to very close to zero. And when Bill saw that they were going to eradicate the last case, maybe six months later, he called you, his boss at CDC, and said, I'm coming home, and I'm bringing my family home. And he told me, you told him, you can't come home. You've got to stay. Don't you realize that what's going to happen in six months is some historic landmark that's never been matched in the annals of public health? They're going to go from 83,000 cases down to zero in two years, and this is going to be a momentous day. You've got to stay there for this. And Bill said, no, I'm coming home and my family's coming home because if I'm still here when this last case is eradicated, then all the credit's going to go to the foreigners. It's going to go to the Americans. And this is something that's got to be credited to the Indians. They did it. They made it happen. And if I'm here, they won't get the credit that they need. I'm coming home. And you said, no, you're not. He said, yes, I am. And he packed up. He put his family together and... They left India and they came home. They weren't able to get into their home because the keys that were sent to him to get in were not the right keys to get in. But he came home. He packed up and left. It was an extraordinary thing, but I've never cross, come across an example of ego submersion that's so complete and so universal in everything he does, still in everything he does. What... What effect on, on your life did your short term in India have? I think I'm just learning the ways that it had an effect on my life. Um, it gave me an experience in global health that complemented what was mostly domestic outbreak investigations that I had. I don't think there was ever any question in my mind, even when I was doing outbreak investigations as an EIS officer, there was no question that I wanted to stay with public health and would stay with public health. But I think this really solidified it. It was just, it was going into another world. I mean, stepping off the plane, out of the modern world, into a world that was 2,000 years old and unchanged. I mean, you could step onto a street where there were cows and elephants people walking, people sleeping, people selling, people eating and bathing and shaving on the street in a scene that was unchanged for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, to have witnessed that and to have been there um, was an amazing, amazing experience. It made me see that there's not just one world, but there are multiple worlds that exist at the same time. And I don't think there's any place as rich as India, even today, you see multiple worlds existing side by side. People being shaved in the middle of a street that's now a major road around a modern city of Delhi. Um, people living their lives somewhat oblivious to the motorized traffic that goes by and to the people who go by in Mercedes and to the people who are doing business in high skyscrapers. But multiple worlds living together at the same time and I think you need to understand that if you're really going to work in global health, that there are multiple worlds where people live and are born and get sick and die um, in parallel universes at the same time. But it was an amazing impact on me. I went on to go back. We went back from Atlanta up to Boston. I had signed up to do a fellowship in infectious diseases at Mass General. But I decided that I had done a lot of photography in India and wanted to do more photography. And so deferred this fellowship in infectious diseases and ended up spending a couple of years 
working on a photographic documentary of patients and illness, trying to show what it was like to be sick. I thought I knew what it was like to be sick, but during this experience I realized that being a doctor is a separate world from being the patient. It's like these separate worlds that existed in India. The same thing exists here. And doctors think they know the world of patients, but doctors know the world of doctors. They know sickness from the perspective of the doctor, not from the perspective of the patient. So I spent some time doing this photographic documentary and spent hours and days and weeks and months with the patients seeing their story and taking photographs and interviewing them to put together their stories. Again, that was a transformative experience for me. It was an amazing experience. And I really realized that I didn't have the faintest idea of what it was like to be a patient. I, I didn't even know that I didn't know what it was like to be a patient. And this experience really showed me that other world. It was also an amazing experience. Did you hear Anne Fadiman when she was here? I didn't hear her. I was sorry to have missed her. But I think she tells the story in an amazing way. Yeah. But she, one of the things that I remember is she said, you don't catch a disease. The disease catches you. And, um, she, she was advocating, one of the things that she advocated was that every chart should have a picture on the cover of the family. But a powerful voice, yeah. you know, for the patient. Is there anything else about smallpox you'd like to say? Well, I'd like to say that this revisiting it for this 30th anniversary of the eradication has been a wonderful thing. Um, it made me realize what a significant event it was. Um, and again, the idea that we could eradicate a disease has certainly affected a lot of the other work that we do. I work now with the Task Force for Child Survival and Development, the task force that was started by Bill Fagey when he left CDC. And we work on a number of diseases where we're aiming for, if not complete eradication, at least elimination as a public health problem or eradication of one aspect of the disease. So we work on river blindness and there's been tremendous progress. We've delivered over 700 million treatments of Mectazan for river blindness. We're embarking on a program where we're treating intestinal infections, intestinal parasitic infections in young children, probably the most widespread infectious disease of children any place and every place in the world. There's probably two billion people at risk for these intestinal parasites. And I think in all the work that we do, we're inspired by the idea of eradication and by the possibility of eradication. I think we think very differently about eradication, knowing that it was done and it has been done. Even in diseases that are not infectious diseases, the latest example is in the area of road traffic injuries. But most people think of road traffic injuries as accidents, things that just have to happen. And in fact, road traffic injuries are an epidemic. They're an epidemic beyond people's ability to imagine. But there are more than 1.2 million road traffic deaths every year. For every death, there are between 20 and 50 serious injuries. And the predictions are that if we don't do anything about this problem, most of which exists in the developing world, it's 85 to 90 percent in low and middle income countries. And if we don't do anything to speed their ability to address the problem and turn this around, and if it takes them as long as it took us, us being the United States, the UK, or New Zealand, Australia, if it takes them as long as it took us, then we will lose 100 million lives to road traffic injuries. We have the tools to prevent it. We have the equivalent of vaccines for road traffic injuries right now, but it's a horrible epidemic that's coming. For many people, they don't pay much attention to this. They say these are just accidents. They're just part of modern day life. And it's this fatalism that's so bad and that keeps it going. But in Sweden, 
In Sweden, a group of dedicated people said we can eradicate road traffic deaths. We don't have to have any of them at all. We can completely eradicate this problem and wipe it out. And they said we can do the same thing to road traffic injuries that was done for smallpox. We can eradicate it. They started talking about this about 30 years ago. And when they started talking about it, people just laughed and said, you're crazy. As you add more cars, as more people start driving, you build more roads, the number is going to go up. Inevitably, it will go up. And they said it's not inevitable that we can eradicate this. And they started working to build safer roads. They, for example, they took out red light intersections and put in traffic circles. They told me red light intersections cause deaths. How? Because what happens when you get to a yellow light, when the light turns yellow, many people speed up. It's you cause a high speed collision and that high speed collision is fatal and red lights actually kill people. And they took all of these red light intersections out and they put in traffic circles and the death rate came down by 90%. 90%. That's as effective as our very best interventions in public health or global health. It's as effective as our best vaccines. So step by step, they built safer roads. They put barriers down the middle that also brought the rates down by 70 to 80%. They built safer cars. Sweden's famous for that. And they made people obey speeding and drinking and driving laws. And by doing that, they brought their death rate down incredibly low. They started with a focus on children. And 30 years ago, there were probably about 137 children who died in road traffic crashes. Gradually, it came down 135, 131, 127. Three years ago, there were 11. Two years ago, there was just one death of a child in a road traffic crash. And Vision Zero is what they call this campaign. And it's inspired by smallpox. And they're going to eradicate road traffic deaths. And I think this is going to inspire the world to start to turn this down. Three days ago, we were at the UN. The General Assembly met. And it met just on the topic of road traffic deaths. This epidemic now is really bad. The burden, the global burden of disease from road traffic deaths is greater than malaria and it's greater than TB, greater than both of those. And the General Assembly met and they passed a resolution that for the first time ever there will be a UN global ministerial conference on this issue. It's going to come to light. And this notion of vision zero that you can eradicate road traffic deaths is going to drive this ministerial conference and it's going to drive the world to change. It comes from smallpox. It's a lesson learned from smallpox. They wouldn't have been so brazen. They never would have thought of the idea of eradication had it not been for the success of smallpox. So though I think we often think, well, how has it affected our notion of infectious diseases? It's gone well beyond infectious disease. And this whole notion of vision zero really owes a big debt of gratitude to the eradication of smallpox. I think it's affected our thinking, it's affected our approach, and hopefully will affect what we can deliver for the good of mankind. Thank you. Um, if we could just switch gears for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you want to take five minutes and tell us about St. Helen? St. Helen? I didn't... Crater Lake or St. Helen? Crater Lake, rather. Crater Lake. Yep. Um, this is for the other archives. Okay. So I don't have to tie it into smallpox eradication. Um, Crater Lake was an incredible adventure. We got a call one day in the enteric diseases branch um, where Jean Gangarosa and Mike Merson were our supervisors. And they said that a lot of people are getting sick at this park in Crater Lake, Oregon. And they think maybe there's a problem there. They're not sure, but maybe it's a problem that CDC ought to help them with. And so the preventive medicine president was sent out there to do a quick and dirty survey to find if there really were people still getting sick and was it widespread. And this preventive medicine president named Jeff Copeland um, did this quick and 
dirty survey, and then we had a conference call back in the enteric diseases branch. Everyone huddled around the phone while Jeff said, yes, it had an attack rate that seems among the staff to be well over 80 percent, and that on tour buses people were still getting sick after coming to the park. They had no idea what was causing it, but could we send someone out from enteric diseases and could we do an epidemic aid investigation? So I get sent out the next day. I flew out. I had to fly first to San Francisco, then Crater Lake is a national park. It's a 200 square acre tract that has the main point of interest is an extinct volcanic crater that's been filled completely with water. This lake is 2,000 feet deep and it's billed as the world's cleanest water and it's billed as one of the seven wonders of the world, Crater Lake. So I got sent out to Crater Lake because something was wrong. And um, I got to San Francisco, but I missed the connection. I left home probably at about 5 a.m. to get to the airport here. I missed the connection there, but then waited around five hours in San Francisco, flew up to, I think, uh, Medford, Oregon, and then rented a car. This was now late at night, very late at night, and had to drive through woods and through forest land for about four more hours, finally arriving at Crater Lake at about um, 2 a.m. Eastern time. And I got there and everyone was sitting around um, the, the Youth Conservation Corps, Jeff Copeland, um, people were sitting there and I was more than ready for bed, but they showed me some reports of the water and I looked at these reports of very high coliform content and it, they said, what do you think about this? I guess I told them what I thought about that. And then the next day we got up early, it was still all covered in snow because even though it was in July, the snow doesn't melt except for a very short period at the end of July and August. So we started out because of these high attack rates, we thought this was waterborne. Uh, but we couldn't prove it, so we set out collecting some water samples. We tried to look at the water delivery system in the park. They said, you don't have to worry about the water because this is the cleanest water in the world, and this water comes from a deep underground well. It's got to be clean. It can't be the water. Well, we were nervous because everyone on the park staff was sick. The park superintendent had been sick for so long, he had lost 35 pounds. Everyone in his family was sick. The attack rate among the staff was over 80%. Among the Youth Conservation Corps, it was almost 100% attack rate of a disease characterized people were throwing up, vomiting, and then they had sustained diarrhea. And the park superintendent, until two days ago, hadn't even thought this was a problem. He thought, oh, 35 pounds of weight loss, three weeks of diarrhea, my whole family's sick. It's just the bug. This is the flu bug. And in fact, the person who ran the concession at Crater Lake uh, told him, this is just the flu. This is what comes every year. It's nothing. You don't have to look into this. And in fact, he had told all his employees to keep working. And so the chef was sick, had this vomiting illness, but he kept a little bucket on the stove where when he got sick, he could use his bucket. And the owner of the concession had told everyone, just keep working. You know, if you have really horrible diarrhea or if you're vomiting, carry a bottle of Pepto-Bismol around with you and swig that as you go. After a day, the snow started to melt so we could start to get some water samples and see that the sewer system had been jerry-rigged and water was going up to the area near the lake with no chlorine in it. So we sent some more samples to be analyzed. It turned out these also came back highly contaminated and people were still getting sick. We did some quick and dirty surveys. And by the end of the next day, we had rough estimates that there were 3,000 visitors a day to the park and that about 70 to 80% of them were still getting sick. So we spoke to our bosses back here at CDC and we said, we think you ought to close the park. They said, on what basis do you propose closing the park? And we said, it's a very high attack rate. It's a very serious illness. There are old people who come here. If they get sick and dehydrated, they could die. Um, we think we ought to close the park. 
we think there's nothing else that explains this high an attack rate as food and waterborne, and we think it's the water, but we'll get the evidence. And our bosses said, no, you need to keep the park open. You need to collect evidence. You just have convenience samples of people calling in for the buses and tourists who come. You need to keep checking. And they said, besides, how do you know it's the water? Maybe this is some mosquito-borne illness. Well, we had never heard of a mosquito-borne illness that causes this level of attacks and diarrhea, but we kept working. The snow kept melting, and the next day, I was doing rectal swabs because we had to get cultures, bacterial cultures, to look for the culprit. And I think I had finished about 230 rectal swabs. I was ready for a break, and Jeff Copeland called me up. He said, you've got to come out here and look at this. The snow had melted, and they found a sewer that had been blocked, and it had all backed up. And the sewage looked like it was running downhill towards a stream. Well, we put some fluorescein dye up behind the sewage to see if there was contamination from the sewage into the drinking water. And we used fluorescein because just one part per million would show up under ultraviolet light. And we thought no one would be bothered by seeing this in the drinking water, but we could see if the water got contaminated. Well, it turned out that the drinking water was this little surface stream. The surface stream was just downhill from where the sewage was backed up. So if you can imagine bright fluorescent green sewage flowing down this snow-covered hill into the drinking water, turning the water green. This was incredibly heavy contamination. And we decided at that point that, and this is the drinking water for the whole park. People would come to the park. There was no other source of water. We thought we could bring in bottled water, but that would take days to bring it in. So we thought that the park really needed to be closed down. Um, so we started issuing signs and putting them around, don't drink the water, don't touch the drinking water. Um, it's not safe for anything except flushing toilets. We went to the concessionaire, we said, don't serve food to the people who are here because you're going to serve food cooked with contaminated water, you're going to serve on plates that have been washed in contaminated water. Don't do it. He said, I've got to serve them breakfast. I've got to sell them breakfast. And we said, okay, then serve potato chips and things that come in bags, but nothing cooked. Well, he served breakfast the way he usually does, with oatmeal made with this great water, with eggs made with this great water, on plates cleaned with this great water. But we had a conference call. There had never been a case of a national park being shut down uh, due to illness in the history. So we had to figure out how do you close a national park that had been never shut. And so CDC didn't have the ability to declare it shut, but CDC dealt with the Bureau of the Interior and they finally got permission to shut down this park. And it was shut on that next day. It was the first time in history that the national park had been shut down due to illness. The park was closed, and they had this massive cleanup job. Massive, because all the water, all the pipes were contaminated basically by sewage. And in the drinking water, if you let it settle, you could see particulate sewage in the water. And after several weeks, the park was reopened and people went back. There were sporadic cases of um, continuing illness, but we went back to investigate that. It turned out that it was just sporadic illness and the water was clean. There was no more waterborne disease. And we thought, thank goodness, thank goodness we're finished. This was one big outbreak. And then I think a few weeks later, you, Dave, came into my office with your sleeves rolled up and you were carrying a letter. <laughs> you said, so I was this EIS officer, still pretty intimidated by what went on. And this was a letter, um, and I think it was from Congress, and it was saying that um, there's going to be a congressional investigation of whether or not there was a cover-up at Crater Lake. And they said, 
would you please explain, Dr. Rosenberg, for the record, um, if what you said when you first arrived there that night, when they showed you these water samples, would you explain if you really said this? And if you said it, why didn't you close the park as soon as you got there? And it said, this is what you're quoted as saying, Dr. Rosenberg, when you got there that night and you were shown the water samples, you said, quote, you've been drinking pure shit. If you said that, why didn't you close the park right away? So this became a long series. We had to prepare. I, it wasn't clear to me how you respond to that kind of letter. You were very cool. You were very calm. I would have thought that if I had one of my low-level employees saying this kind of thing and on the congressional record that I would have gotten rid of him post-haste. But you're very patient. You said, we're going to prepare a response. We'll figure this out. We'll figure the right way to respond. And we did. And we testified. Um, there was a congressional hearing out there in Medford, Oregon. Um, and we went and we testified. And I still have the congressional record from that hearing because the first three pages are solely devoted to whether or not Dr. Rosenberg actually said, you've been drinking pure shit. Three pages of the congressional record. And the superintendent of the park was very sympathetic. He said, Dr. Rosenberg never would have said that. He must have said, um, you've been drinking animal waste. And then someone else asked him, how would he know it was animal waste instead of human? And I'm sure I said what I was accused of saying. I was tired. I was exhausted. I thought I was talking to friends. But that became a teaching case of Crater Lake. And there are lots of lessons to be learned, both how we handled it and what you might expect. And after that, your name was shit. It was, and in certain places, it still is. <laughs> Thank but you, we Mark. survived. I think and we'll uh, end on that. And let me just add... I think for me, I always knew that um, the director of CDC, when I was there as an EIS officer, was special because you would always come around. We were in the enteric diseases branch, and you would always come around the day before the MNWR was coming out. We had lots of stories about whether it was salmonella outbreaks, church picnics, eating contaminated food, and there's always something in the enteric diseases branch coming out in the MNWR. And you always came by. You always came by with your shirt sleeves rolled up, and you would sit down with us and go over it and ask us some questions about it. And you cared about what we were doing. And you spoke to us. And we were EIS officers, and you were the director of CDC. And you came by totally without pretense, without arrogance, just to sit down with us with your shirt sleeves rolled up. And that had an incredible impact, not just on me, all the EIS officers. You knew them. You spoke to them. You deigned to have contact with them. It was an amazing and wonderful thing. And then when this letter came from Crater Lake, um, where you came and you sat down with me and you had that letter, I thought I would have been fired on the spot. And instead you said, let's figure out how we're going to respond to this. And it was together. Let's figure out together how we deal with this. I thought, what an amazing man. What an amazing man. Um, you were, you remain so, and you still are. But that was certainly a formative experience for me, an amazing experience and a wonderful experience. Just, just one of those things at CDC, just another day. It wasn't just one of those <laughs> things, not at all. It was something small that happens every day, but something really, really important. I think as an EIS officer, one of the things you learn is how to bear yourself and how to conduct yourself in this world and with your colleagues and in your business. And I think if you're lucky, if you're lucky, you get to connect with mentors who are an example that's always held out there. I always remember the, a book by William Golding, the author of Lord of the Flies. And in his book, he said that our lives are constructed out of bricks, and we build our lives one brick at a time. But the bricks aren't ideas. The bricks with which we construct our lives are people. They're the people that we meet. 
um, you've been a brick for me, a very important brick, a very important part of my life, and an amazing thing, and I am so ever grateful that I had the chance to work with you. You were one of the products of uh, Montclair, New Jersey, that wasn't cheaper by the dozen. Well, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Dave.